Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see all of you here joining us for this installment of the Monarch Conservation Webinar Series. We've got people still joining us, but I'm going to go ahead and get the program started. My name is Corrine, and I represent the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center. We're partnering with the Monarch Joint Venture to make this series possible for you. Now I'll turn you over to an assistant at the Monarch Joint Venture, Cora Ellison Myers, who will introduce today's speakers. Hi, um, this is Cora from the Monarch Joint Venture. I'm also here with Wendy, who's the coordinator of the MJV. We're excited to be continuing our Monarch Conservation Webinar Series in collaboration with the National Conservation Training Center and to continue to bring information to the Monarch Conservation community. Uh, I'm excited to welcome today's presenters. Starting things off will be Katherine Warner, who is the Sustainability Director for the City of St. Louis. She will introduce St. Louis's Milkweed for Monarchs initiative. You will also hear from Courtney Solem, the Visitor Services Manager at Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge and part of the City of St. Louis's Milkweed for Monarchs team. Our final presenter is Kristen Shaw, the coordinator of Ecological Places in Cities, a practitioner's network within the Eastern Tallgrass Big Rivers and Upper Midwest Great Lakes Landscape Conservation Cooperatives geographies. We'll have time for questions with all the presenters at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, you can write them in the chat box, and then we'll ask them at the end. Now I'll hand it over to Catherine for her presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. In today's webinar, as you've heard, we will have three different monarch conservation presentations, all focusing on urban monarch conservation. The first one will be me talking about Milkweeds for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project. Then Courtney will speak about the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program and the St. Louis Area National Wildlife Refuge Monarch Projects. And then uh, Kristen will speak to the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives and Ecological Places in Cities, also known as EPIC. And as mentioned, there should be plenty of time at the end for your questions. So I'll begin by describing Milkweeds for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project. I'm going to provide you with a little background on how and why the project came to be, and then share some of the highlights of the first year and our expansion plan. For those of you who are wondering why a sustainability director in the mayor's office is giving a presentation about butterflies, I want to emphasize at the outset that Milkweeds for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project, is as much about creating benefits to people as it is creating benefits to monarchs. I'll be explaining why in just a moment. You'll see on this first slide what many people think of when you mention the name St. Louis, and that is the Gateway Arch, the nation's largest, uh, tallest monument. As you probably know, St. Louis is located in the Midwest in what most people consider our nation's heartland and at the center of the breadbasket of the world. From the perspective of a monarch butterfly, though, St. Louis lies smack dab in the middle of its annual migration path between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And these might be some of the reasons why. If you take a look at the natural heritage of St. Louis, you will see that the area was greatly influenced by the Tallgrass Prairie ecosystem. And what is now the city of St. Louis is located just below the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri Rivers, the largest watershed in North America, and also the most heavily used migratory bird flyway. Fast forward several thousand years, and you will find that St. Louis City is now fairly a dense urban area of 62 square miles and has about 319,000 people. Uh, that's within a metropolitan area of approximately 2.8 million people. I came on board as the city's first sustainability director in 2009, and we soon started a three-year process of developing a triple bottom line sustainability plan for the city of St. Louis. Louis Sustainability Plan is divided into seven thematic focus areas representing environmental, social, and economic goals. Each of these goals are further broken down into 50 objectives and 317 specific strategies. The sustainability plan was officially adopted in 2013 by the city's planning commission. One of the sustainability plan objectives is to increase environmental literacy, and there were four strategies suggested as a means of achieving that objective. You can get a sense of what the sustainability plan looks like here, and if you're interested in reading details, the plan is available online. To add a level of commitment and specificity to the City of St. Louis Sustainability Plan, our mayor, Francis Slay, 
developed the Mayor's Sustainability Action Agenda of 29 items for priority implementation from the Sustainability Plan. Here's what the Sustainability Action Agenda looks like. And one of the Action Agenda items is to double the current eco-literacy rate by launching a program to foster an enhanced connection between people and urban natural resources. Since we're intending to double the eco-literacy rate, we needed to measure our current eco-literacy rate to serve as a baseline. With the help of our partners, we developed and conducted a baseline eco-literacy survey in 2014, and we found some interesting results. The top left pie chart shows rates of the following, uh, shows ratings of the following value proposition. Living close to quality outdoor green spaces is important to me. About 87% of people taking the survey told us they either agree with that statement a good amount or a whole lot. On the bottom right, you'll see a bar graph. This graph charts responses completing the statement, I am concerned about ecology and environmental issues because of the impact on, and the top response we received was because of the impact on my health and well-being. That told us a lot, that people value living close to green spaces and that the number reason why they do is they think it is a benefit to their own health and well-being. Among other things, this suggested to us that we take care to communicate the benefits of green space as they relate to people. We also started gathering citywide information and data. We took a look at current conditions, noting strengths and challenges in the city. Top left, you'll see a photo of a vacant building. Actually, it is more like the remains of a dilapidated structure. And the map in the center shows in pink and orange some of the 20,000 or so vacant properties existing in the city today. 20,000 vacant properties in the city today. That's a lot of vacancy. The upper right shows the city's park score map, reflecting lots of good access to our many parks, trails, and green space, but also shows some needs in that regard. While issues like large quantities of vacant lots are challenging to say the least, we believe they also present great opportunities when it comes to creating natural resource amenities to the community. So, <clears throat> in partnership with the Missouri Department of Conservation and the Missouri Botanical Garden and others, the city launched an urban vitality and ecology initiative to strategically consider and address issues just like this on a citywide basis, big picture. As we started laying the groundwork for the City of St. Louis Urban Vitality and Ecology Initiative, I had the opportunity to meet, meet Tim Beatley at the launch of the Biophilic Cities Network. Tim Beatley is a tremendous thought leader and the author of many books, including Biophilic Cities. He also came up with an idea for creating a nature pyramid to represent how often one gets connected to nature and to what extent. I like this idea, so we created one of these nature pyramids for the city of St. Louis. We wanted to show it was important to have both occasional immersions, deep immersions in nature, and frequent, perhaps daily, interactions with our natural surroundings. Even if brief, it's, they're important. Between the two, the city of St. Louis is trying to find ways to encourage both quality and quantity connections between people in nature. Here I've called it our recommended nature diet for St. Louis, making it easy to connect with nature on a daily basis where people live, work, learn, play, and pray. At the launch of Biophilic Cities, I heard about Singapore. I was so inspired by the idea of this city and the city that calls itself a city as a garden that I traveled there to experience it firsthand. For a few days last winter, I was able to explore Singapore and soak up inspiration from a city that is deeply committed to celebrating and incorporating green spaces in the urban environment. It seemed to me that green was everywhere. Biodiversity is a priority and I sensed there was a particular emphasis on butterflies. It was really a wonderful experience. As I was leaving Singapore, I had the good fortune to stumble on the two-story butterfly conservatory that is housed in the Singapore airport. In the midst of the hustle and bustle of a major international airport, people of all ages were taking a few minutes to enjoy the butterflies there. And you can see the joy in the expressions of their faces as they interacted with butterflies in the airport conservatory. What an incredible opportunity, I thought, to be able to experience this moment of delight and transform a potentially routine, mundane, or even stressful travel experience into something so wonderful. I wondered 
How could we introduce something like this to have easy access to nature with simple interaction with something appreciated and beautiful, something that would bring a smile to anyone's face, something inspirational, something quick, something affordable? My trip to Singapore had a profound effect. I returned to St. Louis with butterflies on the brain and asked our mayor, Mayor Slay, what he thought about them. He immediately recounted a story of when he was a young boy in one of the city's parks. He said he could remember a time when there were so many monarchs flying overhead that the sky was nearly dark, but that he had never had that experience again. The mayor said it would be wonderful if people could have that experience like he did when he was a boy in the city of St. Louis today. So Mayor Slay launched Milkweeds for Monarchs on Earth Day last year. Back to the very first thing I mentioned. Milkweeds for Monarchs is as much about people as it is about monarchs. Simply put, nature needs people, and people need nature. We know that monarch populations are in severe decline and that monarchs depend on milkweed plants. The best chance of getting those milkweed numbers back to where they can support monarchs is for people to get involved with planting milkweed and other nectar species attractive to monarchs. And the more that people get involved in citizen science, data collection, or stewardship activities, we know that there is a greater chance that they will stay engaged and develop the kind of environmental ethos that will benefit natural resources over time. By working on monarch conservation in the urban core, though, you also have the potential to realize a number of social, health, and well-being benefits. Studies have shown that access to nature can significantly reduce stress and anxiety, strengthen community relationships, improve property values, and even result in improved educational test scores and results. But while the research demonstrating the benefits of people having access to nature is compelling, I think you really just need to take a look at the expression on a child's face when he or she dons a pair of monarch butterfly wings for the very first time. Frankly, it doesn't matter the age, the sex, the race, or ethnicity. My own layperson's findings are that this delightful reaction to monarch butterflies is nearly universal. What does it take to launch a successful urban monarch conservation program? Having the mayor be a champion of this project has been a tremendous asset, and Mayor Slay's interest and enthusiasm are genuine. He planted two monarch gardens at his personal residence, and here you see him standing in front of the monarch garden at City Hall. The three photos on this page were actually taken by the mayor himself on his phone at his residence. Mayor Slay wrote an article in the U.S. Conference of Mayors magazine and can tell you the difference between various kinds of milkweed species as well as a number of insects associated with the monarch like milkweed bugs, aphids, and hoverflies. Mayor Slay demonstrated his leadership and commitment by having city departments create 50 monarch gardens in public spaces across the city last year. Many smaller gardens were started at our firehouses and police stations and several large monarch gardens were created in city parks. The mayor then challenged the community to create another 200 monarch gardens in celebration of the city's 250th birthday last year. To make creating a monarch garden as easy as possible, the city worked with its many partners, professionals who have expertise in butterflies or native plants, and developed various tools and guides as resources. These are all posted on our website, along with a number of other reference documents and materials relating to monarchs. Another thing to consider in launching an urban monarch conservation program is to leverage the interest and resources of schools and community groups, including faith-based and neighborhood organizations. Here you see one of the larger monarch garden installations in St. Louis. It was done last summer with the support of 150 neighborhood volunteers and the corporate sponsorship of AB InBev. Of note here is the fact that this is basically a grassroots effort supported by, but not led by, the city. It was a great success and turned out to be a lot of fun while making an immediate imp improvement to a neighborhood's community space. With the support of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Missouri Department of Conservation, the St. Louis Zoo designed for us a terrific interpretive panel to place at the 10 largest monarch garden installations. Actually, we have just been delighted with the tremendous interest and wonderful support of numerous partners, stakeholders, and residents involved in this project. Here are some images of local stakeholders, representatives of federal agencies, and local children, all playing a role in urban monarch conservation. Milkweeds for Monarchs is a project that seems to offer something for many people, 
and many people have something to offer to monarch conservation. Take a look at the images in the top right corner of this slide. They show a female monarch laying eggs, the monarch caterpillar, and a chrysalis. These images were not taken by a professional butterfly organization. They were taken by a city resident and shared with the mayor's office from the city of St. Louis. What a great way to encourage and incorporate citizen science and participation. To cap off the first year of Milkweeds for Monarchs, I wanted to share these fun images. One day last fall, the National Weather Service St. Louis office noticed a strange cloud over St. Louis. Upon further investigation, they determined the strange cloud was actually a monarch swarm. Coincidentally, the monarch swarm appeared to be loosely in the shape of a butterfly. Here you see the images posted by the National Weather Service on their Facebook page. Earlier this year, the city of St. Louis was fortunate to receive a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to grow its Milkweeds for Monarchs program. Here you see several photos taken during a media announcement of the grant award. Joining Mayor Slay was Tom Melius, the Midwest Regional Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and representatives, top representatives of the Missouri Department of Conservation, St. Louis Zoo, and Missouri Botanical Garden, all partners in this effort. The event was made all the more special by inviting children from a local children's center to put the finishing touches on the City Hall Monarch Garden. I think much of the future of our natural world rests in the hands of our children, so we want to encourage those learning experiences and positive relationships and encounters as much as possible. I believe you will hear more details from Kristen about the grant we received a bit later in this webinar, but here are the five general items that the grant award covers. One is capacity building to support community outreach efforts. Another is establishing monarch gardens at 25 schools in the city of St. Louis just this year alone. Also developing educational materials, curriculum, toolkits, and programs. Creating new public outreach displays at our St. Louis Zoo and Missouri Botanical Garden institutions. And conducting research on the environmental and social values of monarch gardens and urban prairie patches. In these pictures, you see some of the kids at a local boys and girls club taking in an area with an raised bed, top left, removing the weedy growth, preparing the soil, and planting monarch garden plants. Soon we hope they will be visited by one of these special guests as a reward for their hard work. What's next for Milkweeds for Monarchs? Just yesterday, we submitted a grant proposal to take the successful concept of furthering urban monarch gardens to monarch conservation at the landscape scale. Here you see some images taken along the Mississippi River at the Riverfront Trail. We are proposing to create a pollinator pathway, or butterfly byway, along 19 miles of Mississippi Riverfront by establishing and using a new butterfly brigade of volunteer conservation stewards. The river traverses the entire eastern border of the city, passing by the arch at its center. The photos on the right side of the slide show the flood wall and the riverfront trail and the new Mississippi River Bridge in the background. The left slides show an area to the north of the arch called the Mary Meacham Freedom Crossing. It's a National Park Service designated underground railroad site. We were out there the other day taking photos of the Freedom Crossing site and the potential new monarch habitat areas under construction within view of the river. When I got home, I loaded up the images on my computer, and I saw that I had inadvertently captured a few stray milkweed plants. Let's see, I'm going to try and point them out with this arrow. Here's the arrow and the milkweed plants here. I don't know, maybe you can see that. <laughs> anyway, this is the uh, Mary Meacham Freedom Crossing site and the river here. Anyway, I'm hoping they are a portent of a St. Louis Riverfront butterfly byway to come. Lastly, to serve as motivation for people to create monarch gardens, we created small garden signs. They are attractive, durable, and weather resistant. Here they are, here. Through the generosity of our program supporters, the city is making these garden signs available to anyone who registers a new monarch garden in the city of St. Louis on the city's website. I believe we are up to more than 150 registered monarch gardens. Once someone registers their garden, a monarch butterfly icon appears on a map of the city. Take a look at the map to see just how popular Milkweeds for Monarchs has been in the city of St. Louis alone. Finally, here's my contact information on the website and the website where you can find all of the resources I mentioned in my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of the highlights of Milkweeds for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project. And if uh, you can't get your questions to me by the end of 
this presentation, I'd be happy to be, make myself available to anyone who wants to email me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much for your great presentation, Catherine. Um, everyone, don't forget to write your questions in the chat box to be answered at the end of the webinar or follow up with our presenters afterwards. Now we'll hear from Courtney Solem. Take it away, Courtney. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today to learn about the exciting things happening in the St. Louis area to provide habitat and educate residents about monarch butterflies. Uh, I've been asked to share with you how Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge and the other local National Wildlife Refuges have been contributing to monarch butterfly outreach and conservation in the St. Louis urban area. First, I'd like to share with you a little background on the Fish and Wildlife Service's goals for urban conservation. The Urban Wildlife Conservation Program was established in 2011 when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service set its course for the next decade with the Conserving the Future and Next Generation document. Refuge leadership recognized the importance of engaging our current and potential, urban, uh, potential visitors from urban communities. The goal of the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program is to encourage urban residents to learn about and create a love for natural resources so that all Americans can become engaged and educated voting citizens related to conservation. Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge has been identified as an urban wildlife refuge. We are within an hour's drive of St. Louis, providing an opportunity to both involve urban citizens in conservation within their own community, and also provide education about the Fish and Wildlife Service and our mission. There are a few other National Wildlife Refuges near St. Louis. They are Great River and Clarence Cannon National Wildlife Refuge, Middle Mississippi Rivers National Wildlife Refuge, and Big Muddy National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. We also have a Partners for Fish and Wildlife office nearby. In the past, our refuges and the Partners office had been attending conservation-related events in the urban area as exhibitors or working on some smaller projects for quite some time. What the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program did is encourage us to work together. We're now collaborating on our efforts in the city of St. Louis so that collectively we can provide a better service to residents and visitors of the city and our wildlife refuges. In the spring of 2014, we had the opportunity to connect with other natural resources managers and urban planners to discuss urban conservation. At that time, we became aware of the City of St. Louis's Urban Vitality and Ecology Initiative that Catherine discussed, and of course, the Milkweeds for Monarchs program. We were very impressed by Milkweeds for Monarchs and the plans that were laid out for this project. And we saw a great potential to meet the Fish and Wildlife Service's goal to connect people to nature in the St. Louis community. So we contacted Catherine to discuss how the Fish and Wildlife Service could assist with their project. And um, at the time, we discussed helping out with designing interpretive signs to place at gardens throughout the city. We also provided funding for plant materials and assisted with uh, planting some gardens in the city. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has designed some beautiful uh, banners that are in both Spanish and English, and we've provided those banners to the city as well. Additionally, the Fish and Wildlife Service has recruited volunteer, um, excuse me, interns to assist with monarch outreach in various areas. And two of those interns have been placed in the St. Louis area. One has been placed in Catherine's office to assist with milkweeds for monarchs. And another has been placed at the Audubon Society at Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary, which is just outside the city. Both interns are helping to spread the word about the need to conserve monarch butterflies. They're using social media, interpretive programs, creating outreach materials, attending community events. They're leading citizen science projects, maintaining native prairie plantings, and educating, engaging, and recruiting new volunteers. Some of the projects in the works at the Audubon Sanctuary, uh, they have, like I mentioned, interpretive programs, a Monarch 101 program, and a program on pollinator plants. With both programs, participants are able to go out with a professional and look for monarch butterflies, look at their habitat, and learn about how they can provide that habitat in their own backyard. In the fall, the staff at the Audubon Sanctuary and the intern 
are working with the high schools in the Ferguson Florissant School District, and where they'll be facilitating the creation of a pollinator garden and providing education about pollinators, specifically monarch butterflies and the plants needed to help uh, provide quality habitat in the St. Louis area. And lastly, the Audubon Center will be uh, providing citizen science workshops. They are a monarch way station, and so they'll be hosting tagging programs where participants will have the opportunity to catch monarchs, tag, and release them. I'd also like to mention our work at Creevecore Lake Memorial Park. This park is located in St. Louis County, so it's just outside the city but still within the urban area. The park receives millions of visitors each year, so there's great potential to educate visitors about pollinators and especially the monarch butterfly. We're working on this project with the St. Louis County Parks and Recreation Department, St. Louis Audubon Society, Missouri Department of Conservation, Forest Relief, Wild Ones, and Missouri Master Naturalist. We'll be restoring 50 acres of habitat, and six of those acres will be native prairie habitat and from areas that were all previously fescue grass. These gardens, these native prairie habitats, will be placed in high-profile areas in the park, uh, near a restaurant, along trails, so that people can view them as they're taking part in their regular park activities and learn about monarch butterflies and other pollinators. Um, and we'll have interpretive signs available so that they can learn how they can also provide that habitat in their own neighborhood. We're working to create a partnership with the local school district to provide lessons uh, at the gardens, at the um, prairie habitat at Creep Coral Lake Memorial Park, where the schools can come and use the gardens as an outdoor classroom. So it would be a great benefit to that community. And the last project I wanted to mention is our participation in St. Louis Earth Day. St. Louis claims that it's the largest Earth Day in the country with over 50,000 visitors at this past Earth Day in 2015. At this year's event, we focused our, our booth on pollinators and had refuge biologists in attendance to answer questions about providing habitat for pollinators in the attendees' own backyard. We also provided a seed ball activity, which was pretty fun. Uh, participants created balls of seed and soil encased in clay that they can that they could then take home and place in their own backyard or in their neighborhood to create a small amount of habitat. And then with the hope that once they saw those seeds sprout and grow, that they would continue to plant native plants in their gardens and in their neighborhoods. But what was exciting about our participation in Earth Day is the people's interest in monarch butterflies. Everyone that came up to our booth was interested and had questions about how they could help monarch butterflies. They already knew that the butterfly was struggling, but they wanted to know what they could do to help out. And so we shared the Milkweeds for Monarchs project for those that were residents in St. Louis, that they could then contact uh, the city and learn how to provide habitat in their own backyard. And we also gave our um, expertise about how to create habitat in their neighborhoods. So thank you for allowing me to share these projects with you. And now Kristen Shaw will share with you the work of the Landscape Conservation Cooperative. So before we get started and talk a little bit more about monarchs, I just wanted to set the stage by providing you all with some background information. Information. To start, I'm going to give you the LCC 101 class. LCCs, or Landscape Conservation Cooperatives, are applied conservation cooperatives that allow states, tribes, federal agencies, non-governmental organizations, universities, and other groups to work together as a community to address complex conservation challenges that transcend jurisdictional boundaries, such as drought, climate change, and large-scale habitat fragmentation. LCCs provide two functions. The first is to provide the science and technical expertise needed to support conservation planning at landscape scales beyond the reach of uh, or resources of any one organization. And the second function is to promote collaboration among their members in defining shared conservation goals. 
Now, each LCC is unique in the way that they approach achieving the shared conservation goals identified by their conservation communities. So I won't go into that, um, which is really LCC 2.0, uh, 202, but I'll talk a little bit more about LCCs I work for. There are 22 LCCs within the U.S. I work for two of them, the Eastern Tallgrass, Prairie, and Big Rivers LCC, which, as you can see here on the map, is the beige-colored LCC, or um, mm -hmm. outlined in number four, and also the Upper Midwest Great Lakes LCC, which is outlined in the royal blue, and also number 16. Now, um, all LCCs have really long names, so from now on, I'll just refer to the LCCs I work for as the Midwest LCCs. Um, but the, both, both the LCCs I work for have identified urban conservation as a priority focal area for their conservation communities. And this is where the story really begins. Both uh, Catherine and uh, Courtney mentioned the Midwest Urban Conservation Workshop. And a little over a year ago, we had the, this workshop to bring together the conservation community working in the urban areas to discuss, discuss what the science needs were in urban conservation and how we could create a network for, of practitioners, managers, planners, local governments, and the scientific community to address issues of urban conservation and share lessons learned. At the workshop in St. Louis, we had 46 participants from, from a myriad of professions from five different states, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, and Minnesota. And this is where we learned of all the great work happening in St. Louis with regards to urban conservation in general, and of course, the Milky for Monarch program. Now, besides this being an awesome conference, the main takeaway was that was this was the start of something epic, and I really do mean epic, as in ecological places and cities. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, excuse me, epic, epic vision is to create an interconnected network of cities and landscapes where people live in harmony with nature, and its mission is to provide people living in cities with resources to harmonize people, wildlife, natural and working landscapes, and to cultivate the love of life and living systems. Catherine mentioned uh, biophilic cities and the work that Tim Beatley has done, and this is really a lot of what has inspired the work that EPIC is doing. We have six functional groups that have been identified as priority areas for the EPIC network to focus on. Those are education and train the trainer, wildlife conservation, habitat restoration, community revitalization, landscape planning and research. And both the Milkweed for Monarch project in St. Louis and the EPIC Urban Monarch Landscape Conservation Devi Design project that I'll be talking about in a little bit touch on the five goals of EPIC. Our first goal is to revitalize communities through reconnecting people with nature in urban areas. And then our second goal is to champion wildlife conservation and habitat restoration to establish ecologically resilient urban communities within their larger landscapes. Showcase how conservation and restoration promote thriving green economies and community health and cohesion, expand educational and professional development opportunities for those interested in urban conservation, and lastly, to facilitate conversation on the latest scientific research and practices related to the role and importance of ecological places and cities. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service allocated an additional $2 million of funding through the Director's Fund for Monarch Conservation to build upon the agency's already robust commitment this year to work with others to restore and enhance more than 200,000 acres of habitat for monarchs while also supporting over 750 school yard habitats and pollinator gardens. With this addi additional funding came an opportunity for the EPIC network to put in a project proposal for three urban monarch conservation programs in the Midwest. And Catherine um, talked a little bit about this um, in her presentation, but one of the projects uh, in this proposal was the Plant Grow 5 program through the Blank Park Zoo in Des Moines, Iowa. This program provides guidance on regional garden recipes that attract native pollinators, and they believe whether you plant a single pot on your back porch or an entire prairie field, you can make a difference. Pollinators really do need our help, so they say, let's get down and dirty, plant the seeds, and watch them grow and fly. The proposal was to expand the program to help reach over 25,000 people. Another project that we had proposed was providing the Indianapolis Zoo with a mobile interactive display that could be used on any of the zoo grounds, as well as support on, on the ground plantings and educational signage and distribution of planet, uh, plant plugs and outreach to 5,000 visitors. However, neither of these projects were funded, but the Milkweed for Monarch project was. Catherine mentioned that um, altogether the Milkweed for Monarch program um, was allotted $80,000 $80, uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. $40,000 of this came from the director's fund. The project will uh, focus on uh, excuse me, during 2015 and 2016, the city of St. Louis will partner with the Missouri Botanical Garden and the city, the St. Louis Zoo 
to expand the Milkweed for Monarch project by working with 20 city schools and over 100 educators. And Catherine mentioned that it was a little bit more now, which is even more exciting. Each of these schools will then provide, uh, will put in Monarch Gardens in early 2015 and educate an estimated 1,000 students during the 2015-2016 school year. And this uh, educational outreach will be used, the, will be promoted through the Milkweeds for Monarch Educator Guide that provides educational activities throughout the entire school year. During this process, educators are surveyed to assess their knowledge, values, and practices to help inform the final Milkweed for Monarch Educator Guide that will provide future uh, grade, will feature grade-specific activities and curriculum cr connections, a year-round outdoor learning calendar, maintenance tips for caring for and growing expanding uh, schoolyard pollinator gardens, and local resources for su supplies, expertise, and inspiration. This will be disseminated throughout the entire St. Louis metro region and other educational networks. This project also funds a community workshop that brings together all the educators in a pilot program uh, with 28 neighborhood stabi uh, stability stabilization officers, excuse me, NSOs. Uh, and NSOs are the city's local government representatives who work directly with the neighborhood groups, organizations, and individuals. The other $40,000 uh, for the funding of the Milkweed for Monarch project came from the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, the city of St. Louis contains approximately seven urban prairies area, seven urban prairie areas that were created, restored, and or enhanced within the past decade. In addition to 30 large monarch gardens create greater than 24 square feet that were installed in public spaces in 2014 that um, Catherine had mentioned. 19 of these gardens were installed by neighborhood groups as part of the city's neighborhood na naturescaping program administered through Brightside. 10 were installed at city parks. And one was at the St. Louis expansion site. These seven prairie habitats and 30 monarch gardens will be eva evaluated by three types of measurements. One being floristic vegetation comp composition, which includes plant species presence and or absence, as well as rank abundance. Pollinator attraction, which focuses on which species are um, of pollinators are attracted to which nectar plants um, and also supports their um, entire life cycle. And then finally, community acceptance, appreciation, and benefits, which will focus on um, how, we how pollinator habitat installations, including the installations, affect on knowledge about natural systems and pollinators or the eco literacy that Catherine was talking about uh, can actually change behavior in the spaces and perceptions of the um, installation's impact. Uh, there will be two different sections of this, which is the brief eco-literacy eco socioeconomic survey um, at all 37 of the installations we had mentioned, and then also an ethnographic observation interviews and focus groups um, at five select uh, properties. There's a lot of work being done in urban areas at the moment. In addition to funding the Milkweed for Monarch project, the director's funds also funded the development of, a, of implementation of a 21st century conservation service corps, which uh, Courtney had talked about earlier. In addition to uh, work being done at Two Rivers National, Wa National Wildlife Refuge, there are interns focused at Neil Smith's National Wildlife Refuge in Minnesota Valley. In addition to the Milkweed for Monarch pro program in St. Louis, you can make a difference in whatever city you are in by participating in the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge, sponsored by the National Pollinator Garden Network, which is a campaign to register a million public and private gardens and landscapes to support pollinators. And if you don't want to participate in the Million, million Pollinator Garden Challenge uh, talk, you can start um, similar projects like Milkweed for Monarch in your city, like some cities are talking about during, currently. Through the, uh, additionally, through the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leadership uh, Program, a monarch team working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National w Wildlife Federation plans to work with communities along I-35 to create monarch butterfly habitat along the monarch's migration route. They, they plan to promote and leverage designation of the monarch highway to build support for monarch conservation along the route. This project will consist of three components identification of key resources and players along the I-35 corridor, certification of cities as monarch sanctuaries, and the creation of a monarch migration route road trip event to raise awareness and unite the communities along the monarch highway corridor. These are just some of the examples of monarch conservation efforts in urban areas popping up, uh, popping up across the nation that illustrate how the opportunities for conservation in urban areas is really endless, 
from small scale projects like the Milkweed for Monarch program that focuses on backyards and schoolyards, to golf courses, to even larger scale projects at airports and right of ways along bike trails. And with all this opportunity, really came inspiration to focus on urban areas and the impact they can have on monarch conservation. The Fish and Wildlife Service is targeting monarch conservation in three geographic areas in the US. The Midwest and South, as you can see here, based on the monarch migration. Um, and then the, for the eastern population, the Central Flyway, there's a focus on first generation spring breeding habitat, primarily in Texas and Oklahoma, and summer breeding areas in America's Corn Belt, which is, as you remember from our first um, slide for my section, the LCCs, the Midwest LCCs basically cover this entire landscape. Um, so with the ultimate cult conservation goal of habitat creation to support a sustainable monarch population of 225 million monarchs by 2020, and the all hands on deck approach to conserving the monarch because conservation in one landscape cannot save the monarch alone. We thought this would be a great opportunity to focus on monarch conservation in urban areas by creating a monarch's view of a city. This project will lay the groundwork for design principles to, get, to guide the development, testing, and deployment of future urban conservation for the monarch butterfly across the eastern half of the country. The EPIC Monarch LCD project, or Landscape Conservation Design Project, um, is also to, uh, termed the Monarch's View of a City. This project reflects an integrated and in interdisciplinary approach that includes ecological and social dimensions uh, specific to an urban landscape. In particular, it will hope to address uh, the following questions. How do we strategically design urban landscapes to benefit monarchs? What is the current and projected contribution that urban areas can make to monarch conservation, both from an ecological perspective? If, for example, what is the current level of monarch production in urban areas? How many milkweed stems and acres of nectaring plants uh, can be planted? Is there a measurable response from populations that can be tied to urban habitat? And also from a social perspective, whether or how involvement in habitat planting and monarch-related events lead to additional participation in monarch conservation efforts, um, or looking at through engaging urban populations in meaningful monarch conservation, what is the opportunity to connect them with other conservation issues? We also, would hope, to, we also hope to answer um, where shall we focus habitat work? What is, are the most useful projects and efforts, and where can that work serve other existing urban projects and priorities? How do we best engage urban sectors, um, such as transportation, health, utilities, as non-traditional conservation partners to support monarch conservation. And lastly, can urban areas in the utility um, and transportation corridors that support them along the monarch migration corridor work as a network of stopover refugia for adult monarchs during the spring and fall migration? This project has four main components that will, will be worked on by both the Field Museum and the EPIC network. The first is to develop an urban monarch conservation framework that any city can p pick up and use to create a monarch's view of their city at all scales outlined here from the backyard to multiple scale backways, uh, pathways. Excuse me. The second is to develop a city-based LCD to guide actions for the monarch butterfly, one landscape conservation design or targeted conservation map um, created will be an in-depth look at the greater Chicago area using some of the work done through Chicago Wilderness and two other cities yet to be determined that will use the framework to test um, if a targeted monarch conservation map will, will really, uh, map can really be created from the framework that we've created. Uh, this will be completed in early spring 2016. Based on our targeted monarch conservation ma map, we will um, implement $150,000 of on-the-ground monarch conservation projects from these maps that we've created. And finally, there'll be a workshop in fall 2016 where municipalities, planners, and monarch conservation groups will be invited to, to see the Chicago-based LCD, the scalable LCD templates for two other cities, and the initial monitoring and evaluation results um, from the on-the-ground projects. Hopefully, um, participants will take home the scalable framework to their cities and create them there so they can create their own um, milkweed uh, monarch uh, view of the city. Uh, with that, I'm going to say if anybody's interested in providing expertise on socioeconomic data for conservation in urban areas, their expertise in monarch conservation, or want to tell me about what they're doing in their urban area for monarch uh, conservation, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. 
And now I will turn the floor over to Cora to facilitate the question and answer period. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you to everyone for participating in this collaborative webinar by the MJV and the Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center. Um, I want just first want to say thank you to all our presenters and partners for bringing this information together. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Uh, I hope that everyone learned some valuable information today and will be able to take it into the field soon. Um, if you missed any parts of the webinar and would like to refresh on any of the topics, the webinar will be archived on the MJV website and in NCTC's archives. We'll do our best to follow up with answers to the questions asked during the webinar. And feel free to check out our website for more information in the meantime. Um, if you have any feedback about today's webinar, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, as Karine mentioned, we'll distribute a short survey by email, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Now we'll stick around to have a short question and answer period with our presenters. Um, feel free to stay with us or leave at any time that you need to. And thanks again for joining us. So one question that we had for Catherine um, was, in St. Louis, does the city provide any incentives for citizens to plant milkweed on their own property? Uh, so incentives. I think the incentives are uh, the the resources and the materials that we give them. Uh, we have a couple of grant opportunities. And so uh, if you apply to an organization, a local organization called Brightside St. Louis, they have a neighbor's naturescaping grant process. And we are partnering with them. And we are ensuring that at least one Triple Size Monarch Garden is available in all 28 of the city's wards. Um, so that is to encourage neighborhood scale projects uh, and groups to come together and propose monarch gardens in public spaces. And, um, and then there are additional monarch gardens that are also supported through that grant process. But uh, there is a minimum of 28 that are being supported. And, um, and they just have to meet some uh, basic application requirements and procedural requirements. And we want to make sure that there is a group on hand not just to help install the garden, but to also care for it after it's been put in place. That's great. Um, we also had a question about who is maintaining public gardens in schools and across the city. Um, so is it your trained staff that are going out and doing that? Are there trained staff providing the um, the education to the teachers and the, the students in the schools? Is that the question? Um, the question was more about how is the maintenance happening in the gardens? So again, um, the, ch the schools that have been selected to participate in the program uh, have to both participate in a workshop that we're having next week, in fact, with the educators and a team of community representatives so that they are knowledgeable about the process of putting in and caring for a monarch garden. And they have to demonstrate their willingness and commitment to uh, carry on the maintenance and stewardship activities over time. OK, thank you. Now we have a question for Courtney. Um, Courtney, how did partners increase access to an availability of milkweed and other native nectar plants for residents? And were there any specific strategies that were particularly useful? So you're wondering how partners have provided native seed and plants to residents? Yeah. Well, um, I wouldn't say that we've done much of providing plants to residents, um, other than at some of our public programs, we have um, handed out packages of native seed. And we've ensured that they were native plants, um, and m making sure that we are sticking to the, the native plant list of Missouri and for our residents in Illinois, for Illinois. Um, but we, at least the Fish and Wildlife Service, we haven't been providing plants to many residents unless they're participating in our program. OK, great. Catherine, do you have more to add on how residents are able to acquire plants? So uh, we don't, basically we have um, approached some various uh, sponsors and supporters. And we have received a little bit of support uh, that we can share back 
um, celebratory plants or seeds. Uh, for example, Nestle Purina gave us uh, several seed packets of Monarch Garden mix, uh, Butterfly Garden mix plants, and so we were able to distribute those to those neighborhood stabilization officers to share with their communities. And so from time to time, we have partners in the community who make that make resources like seed packets or plant plugs available, and we distribute them. Um, what we try and do is organize and to, to try and be as fair and uh, equitable as possible, as well as to ensure the longevity and, and viability of the Monarch Garden. We really want to make sure that we're not just giving out a plant here or a plant there, but that it's, it's shared with instruction and um, a bit of a commitment on the part of the, the recipient so that they know what they're getting into and that they're involved in um, creating the garden so they have some ownership and hopefully um, they will continue to pay attention to it and, and look after that garden and enjoy the benefits of it. So we work a lot with community organizations, neighborhood groups, our neighborhood stabilization officers um, and, and, and programs like that to try and really um, build community and um, sense of place in the process. All right, great. Thank you both. Um, Kristen, we had a question for you mm -hmm. um, about how do how do you manage conflict with vehicles in roadside habitat for monarchs? Yeah, so I don't I'm not an expert in monarchs, but um, that's something that um, I think is being uh, addressed through the transportation um, federal agencies. They are uh, currently working looking at that, and I don't, I think that. We've, there's been talk through the Powell Center mapping and uh, other groups like that about how, how do you take that into account when you're putting in your monarch conservation work. And in ur urban areas, the, there won't be, uh, there's potentially less impact from the road, uh, roadways. But we're also going to be evaluating that in the, the monarch uh, view of the city pro project. So we'll have more of a definitive answer. Um, hopefully in a, in a year or so. So, Great. Thank you. Um, and then a question for all three of the presenters is um, how can citizens get involved in starting urban programs like the Milkweed for Monarchs initiative? Well, this is Catherine. Uh, I mean, citizen participation is absolutely essential, and they're the, um, the, the lifeblood of, of a successful program. And so, to, to start a program, uh, it, it, just sort of like the example I gave of the Benton Park Monarch Garden, that was a grassroots-led effort uh, by a citizen who now happens to work in the mayor's office because it was so successful. But if you can um, show your, your passion and your interest and reach out to folks, if you have something to offer, time is something that's very, very respected and, and valuable, and no one ever quite has enough time, uh, let alone resources. And so if you can offer something like time or access to resources, whether it be uh, uh, tools or um, seeds or plants or um, t-shirts for um, planters or whatever it might be, just uh, let, let your interest be known. Um, and instead of asking for someone to do the work, uh, offer what you can do and see if you can't inspire others to join you in the effort. And I think that's my, my biggest recommendation, share your interests so that people know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, that's a great um, answer. And I think another thing for people living in urban areas to think about when they want to approach an organization or a group about uh, creating a, a real collective impact for conservation of any sort, they have to bring in people from uh, multiple agencies. It's not just conservation agencies that can make the difference. It's people working in stormwater, people working um, in transportation corridors. There, there are lots of multiple. There are multiple ways for people to get involved in urban areas. Um, and really, just use your imagination and just talk to somebody about your great ideas, because I'm sure they'll find a way to make it happen if they're passionate about it, like you are. Wonderful. Um, well, I think that's a really good note to go out on. Um, here is the contact information for all of our presenters, and we will try to answer all of the questions in the chat box um, on the Monarch Joint Venture website as well. Well, um, thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you all in August.